Hi, welcome to Art of Academia, a weekly podcast featuring interviews with leading scientists and insider takes on life in academia, hosted by Komal and Madan, researchers from Cancer Science Institute, Singapore. Doing this after super after long. After very long, yeah, yeah, indeed. Can't remember when was the last one. Probably before the conference. Yeah, before we went to India. Over two months then. Damn, no way. Yeah. I mean, we had the conversation with your friend last week. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, like just doing this here has been a while. It's been two months? I think so. It is, um, May is starting soon. We went in Feb. And we haven't done one after that. No. I so mean, you, you came back a changed man. I came back a changed <laughs> man? <laughs> what happened? You tell me what happened. Uh, what happened? Nothing. I guess the, the holidays were like a nice reset. And then just some energy to, I guess, get some work done. Yeah. And I think it was just like a one track sort of a thing. Yeah. The BFT thing helps. So the gymming that I've been doing recently, it kind of forces the schedule. Yeah. Right. Um, yeah. So, and, and the funny thing is, I have not been struggling to do it. That's like awesome. that. That's yeah. why it's also like very strange mm-hmm. almost. It's like, I just <laughs> wake up in the morning and I'm ready to go to work yeah. and I don't have to try very hard. Yeah. What? <laughs> It's yeah, I did that like twice with you and I was just like blown away. Like, <laughs> what is happening? Yeah. What is this life? So I'm like, okay, while this is on, let's not question it. You know, mm-hmm. let's just keep mm-hmm. this going. Uh-huh. So that that's the spirit we have been in. That's so awesome. I guess in the process, some of the other things I want to do, yeah. I fell off the radar. Yeah. A little bit of the podcast, uh-huh. also the writing stuff. We'll, we'll get back to yeah, it. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. It's also like your final year. So I guess time to push a little bit more. Yeah, and I think that, that happens. You can sort of. That's probably like a big sort of subconscious part of it yeah. as well. Because the PhD is coming to an end. And even though I tell myself that, you know, this is like just procedural stuff. It's not like really the end of your research and all. There yeah. is this part of you that is like, okay, no, I need to make something out of this. Uh-huh. Like this I was... mean, eventually that thesis is sort of the culmination of your four years or whatever. Mm. Eventually, of course, you will continue and do and continue the research. But yeah. still, it is a big thing. And then you yeah, yeah, yeah. You and... want to write a good thesis, for yeah. example. Yeah. And and even though it kind of doesn't matter because like four people in the whole world are going to read it. Yeah. And even those four, only one or two are going to read it properly. Yeah. Um, but still. It comes down to you. Like it's... No, I don't think I'm, I'm so worried about it being perfect. But uh, I'm thinking of this more as a opportunity mm-hmm. to like get, I guess, get some practice yeah. basically. Yeah. And you do like writing, so mm-hmm. it would be fun. Yeah. But I haven't really started it full blown, the writing part. Um, I'm trying to do that in like small bits and pieces but the few things that I ha- I did do that pretty I enjoyed it like mm. that was pretty nice so yeah. let's see um, what else what have you been up to what have I been up to for the two followers who've been like you know <laughs> listening to our stuff yeah I have got the job and I'm gonna start that soon woohoo woohoo indeed uh, quite bittersweet mm-hmm. uh, my paper is not out yet but I'm trying to do what I can. Mm-hmm. I think I got really attached to it in the past few weeks. The project? Yeah. Mm-hmm. It's just like, even though you know from the outside that it's it's fine and like, it is what it is. It, you're making a good decision and like you're trying to move on. But I think it still happens that, of course, you worked on this for four years. Yeah. And then you want it out. Mm-hmm. Uh, you want the world to see it. Uh, but that's still a bit difficult because it's not as ready as my, my boss would want it to be. Mm-hmm. So we'll be working a bit more on it for a few months and then yeah. see uh, in, in collaboration with the people in the lab and see if that can reach the stage that he wants it to be at, which is good actually, in a way, of course, like yeah. I also want it to be in a bigger journal, uh, but still no guarantee on what will happen. So in the past few days, I've tried to get over this <laughs> <laughs> and just like relax. It's just, it's fine. Yeah. Like you're, you're losing sense of research and like the motivation around, like, you know, behind doing science because mm-hmm. eventually if it becomes just about the paper, then... Then what? Yeah. 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 So just just being trying to understand that. Yeah. True. And that. I think people, a, a lot of people do get lo- sort of stuck in this. Mm. Uh, I mean, publishing is important. Yeah. Because obviously, is. especially after the PhD, after, mm. you know, you have finished whatever you are finishing, you're moving on. Mm-hmm. So you want that to be completed, but it's not the most important thing. Yeah. And yeah, this uh, changing your lab thing is kind of complicated, right? Because if you leave, then you can't work on the previous project. So yeah. that's part of the problem. But otherwise, I imagine, like, I, I, I agree with you. Sometimes there is a focus on publications. And like you said, even though they're important, it can be, like, now you're just, like, trying to finish up something for the sake of it. Yeah. You know, like, trying to yeah, get it you out. Yeah, sense. I mean, actually, to be fair, I really did enjoy also a lot in the past two, three months mm-hmm. where I really, you know, put pushed through a lot. Mm-hmm. And then a lot of new findings 
I got mm. because I was rushing and I was I really wanted to see things. Yeah. So that excitement and that motivation did help me. Yeah. Uh, if you, but I still feel like, for example, I was discussing with my lab mate and she was like, I can see that it is it is progressing in the past few weeks itself in the in la- last few meetings that you presented. Maybe if you had some more time, you could do better. But I think that's the case for however long you stretch it. True. True. Another two months, I will do few more things and then you know it will still still keep on going. So yeah. that end point just does not exist. True, but what I was thinking is like sometimes this deadline or like a shorter thing of like okay I need this to be done in like three months. Yeah, it can have like a sort of negative impact on the project because there might be good ideas mm-hmm. that are worth exploring, but by default they are like risky or they just take longer, and the shorter timeline sort of imposes you to not try them right. or not test them out. Right, and um, like yeah, that 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 I think is my main sort of complaint with uh-huh. with this. I mean. It's not in your hands. Sometimes there is a time constraint, and you yeah. have to make the most of it. Yeah. Um, so, for example, this thesis actually, in my case, mm-hmm. is a little bit like that. So mm-hmm. I have to get the thesis out by August, which means I need to finish certain experiments. And some of the things that I mentioned earlier, they are going to take longer. Mm-hmm. So now there's already an incentive to not do these longer incent longer experiments. Yeah. Or like at least deprioritize them. Yeah. So that was something I'm actively trying to avoid. It's like yes, you need to finish stuff for the thesis. But in the grand scheme of things, that's not going to matter that much. Mm. Like, what what would be more important is like making good sense of the story, right? Having a good story come out, yeah. and that means doing these longer term experiments. Yeah. So I guess it's about mm-hmm. doing both. Yeah. Yeah, but of course that doesn't apply if you're leaving the lab. Then you yeah. can't really like. <laughs> you can't sort of you. Then right. I guess to convince other people to do it which yeah. is a different anywho yeah but I'm actually super excited to join the new lab uh-huh. and luckily I recently found out that first few months I will be at Anders Kanderup's lab where I will be trained so I am quite excited to you know learn it mm-hmm. nicely as opposed to just going and you know playing around with it so I am excited to get these skills and then apply it of course and then see how much I enjoy it mm-hmm. and then I'll make a call so single cell stuff uh, this is whole genomics transcriptomics, mm. single cell, all sorts of things for clinical samples. Mm-hmm. So because these guys use the like dedicated pipeline from Anders lab, it would make sense to learn from them. From them. And then I could use it with our samples. Oh, that's nice. Yeah. I, um, so it's the best of both worlds. I yeah. can get some training, make some connections hopefully. So it's good to have this this foundation. Because mm-hmm. initially I was just like, I, 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 I'm a bit, out. yeah, exactly. I, I'm, I'm still a bit um, concerned about that though, that, you know, I will be thrown in it mm-hmm. and I, of course, don't have enough skills. Uh, but just this fact that I can sit with them, discuss with them and be like, I don't know shit, can you please take yeah. me a bit and yeah. just be upfront about it. Yeah, that's nice. And yeah, just learn. Mm-hmm. It's a good opportunity. Three months. I don't know the timeline, but maybe two, two months. Two months. That's, that's decent good. to learn most, most yeah. pipelines, I think. Mm-hmm. Uh, of course, I will like work on the side by myself as well. Of co- I don't know how the person who's going to train me will be mm-hmm. like. They might be again quite tough and like you don't know. Yeah, so, you don't know. But still nice. Nice to have that. Yeah, it's a good opportunity. Exactly. I think it, it is. I'm taking this as a second PhD mm-hmm. to start off with because mm-hmm. I'm going to train. It's a very new field. I need to still figure out how to actually ask questions in this context now. Because mm. uh, the field is sort. Maybe let's we can just get into it. Get sure, into sure, the article. sure. Yeah, so I think this one, uh, I was already thinking about this when we talked to Supriya, because when you talked to her about what does a norm- good day looks like, and she was emphasizing a lot on picking problems mm. and how important that was for her research, and it obviously also affects us. And then Nambi, my my colleague in the lab, he posted this paper by, what is his name again? Michael? Michael Fishback. Fishback. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, this guy. So he is a professor at Stanford. And um, he, the premise is basically that we only have like a finite number of weeks in one's career mm-hmm. and how do you make the best out of it. Mm-hmm. And uh, every PhD student or like any project that starts, uh, the planning or the thinking for choosing a problem is mostly like just a few weeks mm-hmm. and the actual execution is a few years. Yeah. So it is very important to pick a problem wisely, mm-hmm. really, you know, play with it, understand it better, like nicely before you actually start executing. Um, yeah, so we can just delve into it. He has yeah, some advice on it. Good. He has some um, uh, ideas just around it. We can spend some time discussing them. Whatever yeah. clicks with us. Sure. Yeah, I can. I can start. So I guess the first one, he got. He says, spend more time on problem choice. Um, yeah. So this, I guess, pretty much follows what you just said, where there is like this imbalance of choosing the topic versus executing on it, and 
that's very true i guess like how it was is how was it for you yeah i was just thinking because in csi you do get um your your sort of mandate not sort of you have to go through like a 6 month rotation yeah. which is like an entire semester yeah. which is a fairly long time mm-hmm. and actually people even complain about it that it's too much time because it eats into your mm-hmm. phd mm-hmm. but i do think it's worth it yeah. like so in during my masters for example we did have rotations but it was optional yeah so i pretty much joined the first lab i was mm-hmm. like oh this is good enough mm-hmm. and there were some problems but in my head that's like oh there's going to be problems everywhere, everywhere. so yeah. this is just something you'll get used to uh-huh. but i think it's only when i did the rotations for my phd mm-hmm. um i realized that okay no this can actually make a difference mm-hmm. like these three options that you have now looked at yeah. um you have like more information with which you can make a Informed decision choice, yeah. yeah and yeah so now i'm a huge huge advocate mm-hmm. um there is like a slightly different angle there about it's also about choosing your pi not just about choosing your project yeah. right for the rotations sure uh, but even within the same lab um it was quite nice i think especially with dennis we did go through several ideas mm-hmm. project ideas mm-hmm. before we ended on the uh, the arch loops um <laughs> 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 uh, and i i really appreciated it yeah 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 so where he emphasizes um on the fact that if you like basically jump on the first idea you you get hmm. um obviously it, it might not go well and then once you're committed to it it can be hard to give up which is actually true and this is true even if you have for example take like considered multiple projects yeah. this is still an issue right especially with the phd um, you're still quite naive and it's i guess even for the pi's it is difficult to figure out how this thing will pan out yeah but the, somehow maybe maybe it's because you know like during when you propose your project you sort of have to give it an official title or i mean whatever if things aren't working out i do think like we take a unusually long mm-hmm. period of time to accept it and uh-huh. change the project yeah or There at least like there's a very like, nice line that he says i'm not sure where now uh, yeah he says at one point that performed the go no go experiment at the earliest feasible moment mm. this is true even if it requires some compromise build a clunky pro- prototype and see if it works even a little yeah 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 and like just making those decisions are absolutely essential mm, mm. again i think the same thing we do start getting attached yeah a bit to the things that we have been working on and the thoughts that we have been building so much mm. uh and being able to put a stop to it when you think it's not going not anywhere working, it's sinking yeah. is super important true true and fair enough i guess he has more more to say about that later so mm. we'll come to that mm-hmm. uh, but i guess in terms of spending more time uh yeah i guess we can just say i'll just read what he says mm-hmm. so one common failure mode he says is to jump on the first idea you get and get started yeah and um so he he says to basically think of ideas like leeches that are trying to make a meal out of your time yeah uh so you consider the high points but you yeah. treat them with some skepticism mm-hmm. um yeah and i guess the other point here is like maybe evaluate multiple of them hmm. multiple ideas in parallel mm-hmm. and then choose like the best one right So I think definitely merit to that more people should do that if they haven't or aren't already. Yeah. Um yeah, I I think I'm just why I'm not 100% sold on this is like when you're starting out you really can't gauge which is a good idea. Like you can you can weigh the yeah. odds and maybe try to make an educated guess, mm. but I feel like your probability that you get it right as a at least as a new PhD student pretty low. Right, right, right. If yeah. I had to guess. Yeah, it's difficult to make make those comparisons but also i think this is more so f- as a learning learning thing true true yeah you Maybe of course you tried a few problems during your phd 3 4 years and then you will keep on doing this this iteration of choosing a problem working on it for a few years mm. a lot of times mm. as a pi i guess i don't know for 20 30 years or so, mm-hmm. so that's a pretty long time and then getting better at this is obviously very useful for sure yeah and and he has more thoughts on like how you make corrections along the way so we'll yeah. do that when we get to that yeah. Yeah for me actually I did not get to do rotations when I started my PhD so I did not have this this opportunity to compare mm. groups and compare the sort of research people are doing I think I was quite naive mm-hmm. at that point uh and then when I started in the lab I started with like some random experiments so initially I talked to most of the postdocs in the lab and then depending on what I found most interesting I tried to build things with them that sort of did not work out I feel like I never had a very clear problem Mm. to start with mm-hmm. so i think i just like really started with like smaller things okay let's see this and then things kept building mm-hmm. from there instead of being like oh this is my bigger problem and that's what you know i'm trying to figure out and then i'm moving ahead from right there. i i mean so my thoughts on this is also 
because as a at least for me right so when i think back to it when i started out uh, it was a new field i had not worked on a, like i looked yeah. anything dennis or jason do for that matter completely yeah. new so when you're like still in the phase of trying to understand stuff i feel like you don't have a lot of in, like not even intuition you don't even have the knowledge necessary mm-hmm. to come think of like what is a big problem yeah. so for yeah. me for example i was relying heavily on the review articles i was reading yeah, yeah, yeah. right and they were all like yeah i lives in dna damage that's the shit and mm-hmm. you know you should focus on that mm-hmm. and when you have nothing else that seems like okay cool yeah. you know all these people are saying that is important yeah. so maybe it's important uh uh-huh. but now that i come now that i look back and now i've learned more about the field mm. starting from a review a review paper is probably the worst thing you can do because <laughs> other people are reading it right yeah. so first of all it's There already like a thing that's on okay. many people's mind yeah. and fair enough sometimes you you do work in fields that are more competitive i guess um uh, but then if you're if you're because the review paper itself it has some uh some like the way they construct the story it is like leading in certain directions mm. like so forget about the questions they highlight are left or not it also like shapes your thinking in a certain yeah. way yeah. based on how they are thinking they're thinking about the field and yeah. it can be disconnected from what the actual research looks like mm-hmm. so if you had if you were to like now go back mm. take the year or two that it takes to actually read all of the stuff and digest it mm. you might come up with a different conclusion mm. which is what happened in my case mm-hmm. so I feel like I did do that yeah. where I I did consider all these different ideas and spoke to a bunch of people. Yeah. Um and I did make an informed choice. That's but cool. the choice was still stupid. <laughs> and I think that's I inevitable. Mean, that's, yeah, exactly. That's bound to happen. Yeah. But still you went through the motions and you know, you you did this this whole process is pretty nice. Yeah, but, but but I guess what I was trying to say is that I can also see a case where it's nice that you you start with no assumptions basically and then you start like sim- start simple. and then you start building based on what you are saying hmm. might that might right, not right. be so bad right 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 yeah because it's more unbiased in some ways true. and true it's just that you have no clue about the the problem yeah it might not hand. build up to anything useful exactly. it's possible i guess exactly yeah because i remember like discussing things in the lab meetings in your early lab meetings especially where you're like proposing shit people will like shoot it down so quickly mm. because and with like proper backed arguments because mm-hmm. obviously they just understand the field better and whatever you were saying was just nonsense even though it made so much sense to you yeah yeah experience experience <laughs> yeah but i guess we will we will also eventually keep shifting fields mm-hmm. so the whole process will happen again yeah. but just faster okay you want to do this the mm, next one what's next that's basically okay so he just gives some ideas on how to sort of choose problems so he gives it calls it exercise intuition pumps mm-hmm. and avoid common traps he is just basically giving few examples by which a new problem can arise so you can start with say making a one off perturbation and then just measure what happens so you can just pick a favorite gene mutate it and look at whatever phenotypes it can play a role in here again i think like if if you really just follow this thing choosing one gene it could either be like something super popular like braca2 mm-hmm. and then trying to find new new functions versus something for example clarissa was talking about mm. something super uncommon the gene that you really don't know what yeah, it might be doesn't even do. have a name <laughs> it doesn't have a name yeah it was some like some CR, yeah. yeah right 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 yeah so in that case again it's um maybe i don't know how to find a balance there because in that case it might be something super important and super novel mm-hmm. but you have nothing no information to start with hmm i is this where he defines like yeah it does right so what? i thought this was cool although i don't know how useful it is mm-hmm. but he basically like classifies all biological projects uh based on two things right so the first angle is like it's either perturbation mm-hmm. measurement or analysis yeah. and then the second <clears throat> yeah technology versus logic correct yeah 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 now i see it yes yeah so i mean it's i don't think it actually changes stuff but i thought it's cool that you can classify your project mm-hmm. like that so i Where guess Where do you think your project lies yeah so mine according to this definition would be measurement logic because i'm using a technology that's already established um and trying to measure our loops and then trying to come up with new biological stuff so mm-hmm. mine would be measurement logic mm-hmm. which i thought yeah i mean that doesn't change anything that doesn't make just like when like having this classification yeah it's cool yeah, yeah i think it's nice to know that hmm. having yeah. this yeah it actually makes your thinking more clear as well mm. yeah uh, uh yeah and i think i also like the traps that he talks about mhm one like he talks about a few traps to avoid so one of them is just recency 
or familiarity bias mm-hmm. i i do see this happen in the lab so for example somebody somebody senior in the lab is working on something they brought out something really cool and the next project somehow become something very similar I see. it's just like for example in our lab uh, right now lirens paper showed mgo and aldehyde and its effect on braca2 pr- protein degradation etc and now future projects are sort of now talking about other aldehydes mm-hmm. um uh, and how they perturb braca2 yeah. and then if they can also induce mutational signature so it's literally just the same project just the, different the, the the metabolite has been changed right um so i i think that is something one should avoid because mm-hmm. it is easy to fall into this trap because you already see progress and you see you can feel a bit like oh this will succeed yeah and people already have interest in it in the in the lab right now mm-hmm. uh but i think maybe down few years down the line when you're trying to put it out there's really not much novelty mm. to it and i think you won't be thinking and executing as much much differently than what has already been established true this is a very good point i'm also re- i don't want to take names but i'm also reminded of another lab where this is the case where they have they have made this discovery um which is like pretty cool and very interesting in one system in one cancer so now and this was like a couple of years ago so now almost the typical phd project is they have a hint of in which other cancers this might be true yeah so the entire project is okay now you come in as a phd student and you check if everything we did in this cancer applies in this cancer mm. so they're doing the same experiments mm. you know yeah. you already know and yeah. i guess you you have the pipeline set yeah so, so you're just like, like doing just everything doing mm. everything one more time mm. and yeah i guess the nice thing is you're guaranteed yeah, exactly, the results exactly. and um, they already have good reason to suspect that this is true in this in this yeah. cancer already yeah. so it's very likely positive results right but like you said yeah it's not super novel to mm. start off with i think for from like pi's perspective it's still like he for him or her the field is moving yeah. in in their lab yeah yeah for so them they're like widening their base right exactly. we've now we've showed it in all these cancers so whatever yeah but yeah. as a phd student you are not learning so much mm. true it's yeah. something to navigate yeah uh what else was there I mean, there are more traps to avoid do you want to go through them or Uh, let me see if there's anything interesting being a truffle hound what was a truffle hound so the truffle hound is, <laughs> is like basically oh, yeah, yeah. it's apparently a dog that has been bred to sniff out truffles no that cannot be it really? let me find out <laughs> i googled this when i read it last like time truffle hound an animal so trained and bred for one narrow purpose that it is no good at anything else yeah yeah but what is a truffle hound yeah it's it was bred it was that a truffle hound is a dog that has been trained to hunt for truffles i guess mushrooms <laughs> and that's all all it does okay um anyway so i guess that's what he's saying one trap yeah. is like don't be that guy who's doing only one thing yeah but come that one is interesting because you do want to specialize mm-hmm. and i guess that is bringing you some benefits but i guess you're doing some doing it in balance self serving bias okay and then cargo cult fallacy that one was interesting so the cargo cult fallacy is basically if you mm-hmm. like a person and then you want to be like them so you end up doing the exact same work that they're doing yeah. and he says that's not the right approach what yeah. you rather want to emulate are their like principles hmm. and values and not do exactly what they're doing but yeah. Yeah. do it how they're doing mm-hmm. or something okay cool mm-hmm. okay so the next one is about risk so don't avoid risk befriend it yeah this one was also pretty interesting um so he basically talks about um so whenever you're evaluating a new idea to work on he says to put it on um uh, a graph with two axes the x axis is risk basically is it low risk or high risk and on the y axis is impact is it low impact or high impact and it's about trying to balance the two so i guess on the risk angle oh, actually wait yeah so for the risk angle he has some thoughts on how you manage risk during yeah. the project mm-hmm. and he has like a, a sort of a method for it where you basically lay out all the steps uh, and steps meaning not just the things you have to do but like your assumptions so things that have to be true yeah. for it to work like this right. and this could be biological facts so for example there is only like um these genes that will get changed when i make this perturbation whatever so that's an assumption you don't know that you're assuming um and then the second thing is like a technological assumption it's like yes i will be able to for example profile these genes by yeah. this normal rna seq which is yeah. also an assumption yeah. so that's what he says you mm-hmm. first list down all these assumptions 
and then you score them based on uh, how risky they actually are, like how likely it is that they are true, um, and then the time taken to actually find out if that is really the case. Mm-hmm. And I guess you then for, you do that for each of your assumptions, and then you can uh, look at them. Yeah. So if there's anyone that is both very risky and it takes a long yeah, time to find out, he thinks these are the ones where you should like really reconsider. Mm. See if you can avoid them, change them. Mm. Um, and I thought, okay, that's, that's a pretty good thing to mm-hmm. think about. I don't think I've ever I have never done that, done that for my yeah. project. Yeah, I mean, you do that like for maybe a few specific things that you're trying to do. Mm-hmm. Uh, like you are at a, but not at the very beginning. Like yeah. while you are in it and you are thinking about ways, directions to take, mm-hmm. at those points, I guess you, in the discussions, this does come up like, oh, this actually, this idea is interesting, but really risky. Um, yeah, but I've never done this in such a systematic manner. Yeah. And I think for me, the what was cool is like really thinking about it explicitly and putting it, putting a number on it. Mm-hmm. I think that I have never done. Yeah. I actually find it quite difficult as well. <laughs> yeah. And what? And all the timelines. Is, I mean, timelines, I guess, for experiments, you can sort of figure out. And obviously, in reality, it would be much longer than mm-hmm. what you put down. Yeah. Yeah. But he says this as well, right? Like, an, in these cases, an educated guess is better than, like, absolutely nothing. Mm-hmm. Uh, which is true. And what I liked about it is, like, if if you were to do this, I guess then you can have a conversation, for example, mm-hmm. with your PI. Mm-hmm. You, you can be like, hey, this is the estimate I have yeah. of the risk this this is and yeah. the time it's going to take. And, and I think that could be pretty interesting because... Often when I'm talking about projects, uh, we sort of like skip or like push all the steps that it would take under the rug, right? We, yeah. I don't explicitly, for example, talk to my PI about, okay, I need to do TRNA seek. Yeah. I think these are the things that might not work. Yeah. And these are the things that will take this long. Mm-hmm. What do you think about it? Mm. And it, I think it would be curious to see how differently we gauge it. Because mm. they are obviously more experienced in some of these things, right? Right, right, right. right, right. And I feel... At least it might make it... So let's say, for example, I'm averse to doing something and Dennis is not averse to it. But I feel going through this process might bring us close to the... Mm-hmm. the main, on the same the main, page. Yeah, yeah. yeah, if not on the same page, at least on the next few pages uh-huh. instead of different books or something. <laughs> <laughs> Fair. I think, yeah, I think that makes sense. And even when you're like trying to maybe... A lot of times it happens that you are at this one stage and you can take the project in multiple directions. There as well, this sort of a process would definitely be quite quite helpful. True. Yeah. So when I read this last time, I actually sat down and I started doing it. Oh, that's cool. So I haven't done, I haven't started putting the numbers to it, but I laid down some of the assumptions. assumptions and stuff. Yeah. Yeah. So I think I will try to finish that. That's and nice. Then, and then show it to Dennis and mm-hmm. have a conversation. Yeah. And he also talks, like, and somehow we do, most people are sort of risk averse. Mm-hmm. But he also tries to say that we are not trying to eliminate risk. Yeah. It is actually still more risky thing could bring out like bigger impacts or like bigger outcomes as well. So mm-hmm. you, you're not trying to really avoid it. Yeah, does it? Oh, yeah. There was one thing mm-hmm. here where, and I thought it was curious. I haven't given mm-hmm. it that much thought. But he says, in some cases, it's possible to design a project that can succeed no matter how the data turn out. Mm-hmm. Right? So... Basically, the type of oh, project... Oh, that's where I actually thought about your DNA damage project in the beginning, the way it was. In the you sense? Were saying if, if our loops create damage or save, like, reduce damage, mm-hmm. either way, it's, like, interesting. Yeah, yeah, but there's a third option. What if they don't do either? <laughs> <laughs> right? And I think that's, the, the at least in my system, that's mm-hmm. more the case, that right. they might have no impact on <laughs> DNA damage or repair. Uh, anyway. Yeah. Yeah, so I thought that was cool because that's also something... At least I have not given much thought to hmm. of like, how can we do this in a way that no matter hmm. what the reality is, we get some something useful out of it. Yeah. So I guess the examples he gives is like, instead of doing a genetic screen with one kinase, mm-hmm. you do a panel. Hmm. And in that way, you're guaranteed you to get do something. some relative comparison and then get some, some insights. Yeah. It's more work, but I guess you increase your chance of success. Yeah. So maybe it pays off. Mm-hmm. And that, I guess that's something to keep in mind. I don't know how it would actually play out. Like if now I were to design my experiments with this in mind, mm-hmm. I'm not sure what I, sh- I would necessarily change. Yeah. So maybe like, for example, if I'm trying to do now this poll three chip seek, mm. I should do, I mean, this is more technical, but maybe I should just test like seven, eight antibodies instead of testing one or two, which is what I'm doing. Oh, instead, uh, instead of like just one target, uh, what I was thinking is do that... Do many targets. Yeah. Mm. But that, then that does blow up the work by crazy, right? Blow up the work and also the thought process, I think. 
because now you're just becoming you know a bit because i see this also in people being super fomo mm. about losing out information mm-hmm. so then you try to do everything maybe you can pick something from all of this and then move on but it can also complicate things and you know complicate hypothesis building mm. in a way because now you're not starting with a clear idea and you're like just like oh let me throw Let's things and see what happens and see. Mm. yeah it both Fair has enough. pro and cons yeah, yeah. like i don't i don't have a side i'm Fair just trying enough. to think true true literally. i can see both sides of this yeah, yeah. I think for me I would like to do like multiple projects at a time something a bit risky you know more fun and something a bit safe mm. where I'm doing things still interesting but I know you know it will give me an outcome mm-hmm. and another one is like more like you know funsies yeah yeah <laughs> this was actually Dennis's suggestion so when I came in he he and I think this is how he proposes it also for most people yeah. one will be sort of like method development and then the second one will be um either applying that method or like slightly independent which is a bit more risky mm. and usually it's not met- it's not method method development is not the right way because that implies that you're building a new technology it's more like so for example wayne his project is what the safe project is comparing like existing bart and ligases and then seeing which one performs better no one has done this like in one system systematically yeah. like everything that's there and this is exactly something that's guaranteed to give you a result because mm-hmm. you could you can actually conclude by saying they all work the same mm-hmm. or like you know mm-hmm. this one they is better be, yeah. exactly mm-hmm. and all, that all of that is valuable information mm-hmm. so that's a very safe project mm-hmm. um and 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 then for his other main project he, it, this was very well designed actually because now that he's comparing all five then he will take like the best one and then use that for his project so this is like it flows yeah. you know yeah well designed he proposed this for me too but i just looked at the amount of work and i'm like why am i just comparing these five things this sounds very dreadful i don't want to mm-hmm. do it yeah i think what what was the riskiest thing i did during my phd wow <laughs> <laughs> yeah i mean several ideas were like yeah i don't know what's happening and a lot of time obviously you start doing things and they just don't show anything then you're like okay mm. but i guess we nev- i never at least systematically thought of it this way this problem that i'm thinking is risky mm. and then then think, seeing how actually it panned out i think one thing that has to go into this is like like risk can be how stupid is this idea but it can it can also be like he says the time it takes right like mm-hmm. that's also a key component mm-hmm. if it's like a very dumb idea but it takes one day to find out that's totally fine uh-huh. i would just check you uh-huh. know but if it takes maybe like true 4 or 5 weeks true. then there's something to yeah. consider Yeah we will come to I think one of them one of the points I can't I guess learn the altitude dance there's there's where we can discuss this for mm-hmm. Okay okay enough risk yeah, let's enough do risk impact <laughs> Okay so for impact he says for basic science at least mm. um we want to read the heading what does he call it He calls it pick the right optimization function mm. Yeah so here again he has a plot to sort of figure out what sort of an impact your work could have and he separates it with the x axis being how much did we learn for for basic science and the y axis is how general is the object of study mm. so you could be doing things which teach you a lot about the field but it's not really general or you know more fundamental for the field uh, or mm-hmm. you could be doing something very general but not something but you won't learn so much out of it mm. so does he I say guess, pick one or does he say do both Uh I mean he's just talking about the axis and then he's saying that of course it's nicer to be high on both. Mm. Uh and then he's just giving a few examples. So for example, so if you can't go wide, go very deep. Is that the suggestion? I would think so. Yeah. Yeah. Then I agree. Yeah. So either like super high on either axis, mm. best is obviously high on both axis. Right, right. Yeah. Fair. Yeah, and for technology development it's a bit different. So instead of talking about how much did we learn, how general it was, for technology it is more like how widely will this technology be used mm. versus how critical it is for application mm. so he gives a few examples here so for example crispr is a technology which is really widely used and it is very critical very also critical. these days um everybody is using it yeah. very fundamental now it's actually quite crazy mm-hmm. now this thing just boomed up so much true um and very was, recent very recent yeah i remember for my masters project actually my my mentor was working on crispr mm. and that was the time it was super recent mm. so at that time it was even extra exciting because now i think it is more like the, the system is there yeah, yeah everybody can do it yeah now we just um yeah and then there are other examples for example blast mm. which is also something very widely used but not really essential for your experiments yeah. you just like finding small things from it which is still cool um 
and the are there examples of critical but not widely used definitely uh, i guess yeah so there the example is light sheet microscope and talens Yeah, the talent talent is also something similar to CRISPR, I yeah, think. So just an older CRISPR. technology. Mm-hmm. So I guess at that time it was still super critical for your experiment, but now CRISPR is more widely used. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I guess yeah, some sort of other technologies like I don't know, cryo EMM and things like that, which not everybody is using, but whoever uses it, you absolutely it, need it. Yeah, you, yeah, yeah. It gives you that specific information that you're looking for. Yeah, structural people always. scare me yeah, <laughs> like, yeah, what the fuck are you like, doing yeah like it's like data sheets and yeah. like this i don't, I don't understand know, yeah. but looks you cool see this interaction <laughs> like do we okay good for you <laughs> yeah i know i mean oh wait i thought you would pick up on this one where the where the um, optimization function can be how can we make this cheaper like you know like for example how many children in low and mm. middle income countries yeah. would now have access to a microscope yeah um or some how many quality adjusted life years did we save per 100 dollars spent which yeah. is an interesting thought yeah. maybe doesn't apply so much it to like the type of work rich that you're doing and all that but right. if that is your goal then of course this is the way you would measure the impact true yeah. i mean this can be definitely true for like research in india right mm-hmm. where money is sort of a constraint yeah. and then you want to do the most impactful work with what you have yeah maybe time is something to consider here as well like especially for a phd project how much impact can you do given the four years that you have hmm. yeah really we should really put a lot of thought in the problem <laughs> thinking at least i don't definitely give enough yeah but again the flip side is how close are you to getting it right you know yeah but you need to get into the system first mm. you try if if i never thought i would never know mm. at all mm. if i at least think about it even if i went wrong i would have some ideas of what went wrong yeah Okay so the next one is called fix one parameter let the others float. Mm. Okay first of all absolutely love the phrasing. <laughs> you know like this guy uh, he chooses a lot of like pretentious ways to say things and I'm loving it. Uh, and and the ideas are often rather basic but you know mm. the the phrasing, phrasing makes fancy, yeah. makes it uh, for me. Anyway okay mm. so fix one parameter let others float. Um I guess pretty self explanatory so he's talking about when i guess coming up with a new idea mm. uh, or like a hypothesis you might have a lot of things that you could potentially change mm. um but and, and you can it can go either ways either you are being too specific in all the things that all the parameters you have so for example the cell line you want to work on um the gene you want to look at So one mistake you could do is fixing too many things hmm. um and that way you are like limiting your options and and the likelihood that it works. Yeah. Um but he also says it, it might also be a problem to not fix enough things. Then there is like too many things too to big. test. Yeah. Um and that can also be like limiting in, in yeah. a different way. So yeah. op- ideally you want to fix one or two key parameters and then let the others float. Hmm. Which I think is pretty good. um have i done that not particularly i think me, I, me yeah it's true that i haven't really like formulated my research question in these yeah. in these terms yeah. which is quite interesting because and the funny thing is like these things yeah these things have come up so there was this question about okay which cancer cell cancer model should we work yeah. in right and i'm like ah, we'll figure it yeah, out yeah. <laughs> <laughs> i feel you because like now Because while while I was doing my PhD, it was just me. Mm-hmm. So I was just doing and like going by the flow, as you just mentioned. Oh, this thing. Okay, let's try this. We have the system already. See, we're curling and whatever. Uh, but now in the lab, I see when like there are more PhD students, and in an initial stage, these thoughts you know come up so often. I was mm-hmm. like, was I who just never thought about these things so seriously, or these think- guys are thinking too much mm. about the technical details of things? But mm. I guess these are important decisions, and I just never gave them imp- enough emphasis. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I guess one question which I thought was I guess useful is a thought on uh, which parameters you should fix. Hmm. And he says this should be determined by a combination of your interest and expertise of the lab. And yeah, I thought that was right. interesting because I have relied heavily on the former, on the interest hmm. and not enough on the expertise of the lab. That's true. And I That's think true. I this is something I have like even though this has been pointed out to me so when mm. i remember explicitly actually coming into the pro- coming into the lab 
the conversation was what do you want to do yeah. and then same i'm going out into the pubmed wilderness mm-hmm. and then figure picking random papers and yeah. i'm like oh this seems cool this seems yeah. cool and i did not give enough consideration into what the lab is actually good at doing mm-hmm. right mm-hmm. and throughout this process i was even reminded yeah. like sometimes explicitly yeah. like i remember grishma telling me you know this would this is a cool idea mm-hmm. but we would struggle doing this in the lab we yeah. have no idea how to do this right 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 and i was like damn good you're right <laughs> yeah. i didn't even think about that <laughs> um and the flip side also is that we do have some things that we are good at mm-hmm. which other people struggle to so mm-hmm. that would be an easy win mm-hmm. if you like incorporate it i get it. that completely yes and and for example i really feel like i have not taken enough advantage mm-hmm. of the technologies we are good at in the lab yeah because that's the point right like having that expertise in the field over other people and then you can just ask a few questions that other people will struggle yeah with. so silly like yeah, yeah. how did you not consider this right 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 so i think this is something i am course correcting for mm. so now i am doing proximity ligation and Let's i go. am doing more mass spec stuff <laughs> so hopefully that pans out right yeah yeah i think exactly the same for me i when i started in the lab in general i knew what the lab is doing but i never paid attention to what sort of techniques people are using what sort of you know mm-hmm. questions are being asked which can be answered with the things that we already have mm. i am like starting with fucking cell free dna mm-hmm. nobody does it in the lab yeah. like eight axis sequencing nobody does it in the lab but then eventually yeah like something will happen we'll make collaborations or whatever mm-hmm. and then eventually it pans out it works yeah. out but it definitely takes much longer than something that you could just do mm. with the existing things yep um they are same for me uh in the future in the next jobs i am joining people who have expertise and i will be learning that and employing mm-hmm. that instead of yeah. Just going somewhere doing what you like random things yeah. yeah yeah the next point he talks about is learn the altitude dance um so of course projects do not unfold in a linear fashion things keep on moving you have to keep on like changing your your strategy and the way things are happening so he talks about four levels level 1 is tactics level 2 is strategy level 3 is specific question and level 4 is broad question uh at least for our level i think the like phd students early postdocs we are mostly playing we we have first do the specific question and broad questions to start with or like once in a while mm-hmm. but we are mostly playing with the strategy and the tactics and he is saying that we need to give enough time to both and we need to keep moving between the two so tactics is just executing things mm-hmm. you start experimenting and you or coding or you know the actual things that will give you results you really go full in it and strategy part is basically you move out of all the things that you just did and now think sitting back looking at what you have from a third perspective and now strategizing uh just just thinking rethinking and making plans etc mm-hmm. and he says that these two both both these things take sort of they are like full time jobs yeah. so you can't be doing them together mm-hmm. and you need to like give allocated time for doing this and keep on jumping between these two which i think is absolutely important as well yeah what would be a good uh, timeline to split them are we talking about like spending 6 hours of a day on the tactics floor and then the last hour you go to the strategy floor or is it like you spend a week on tactics floor and then you go to strategy over the weekend or something like that yeah i was thinking more like the latter okay yeah it's, it's a week of doing and then one day one or two days of thinking mm-hmm. or like not even like as structured but basically as and when you think you know strategizing is again required so you just take a stop mm-hmm. and you sit back and you think yeah as opposed to still keep on going because it's easy to keep going right because mm-hmm. you see some results and you're like oh i can just repeat this thing or yeah. you know i can just add these few more inhibitors we have them in the lab mm-hmm. we can do these experiments it's easy but that's time that's effort and that's you know reagents of course which we don't think as much i feel you because it's to- i mean it's you, the two things here one you said that's easy but that's actually something i struggle with <laughs> to like just try other yeah, stuff yeah yeah no i mean um, easy in terms of it doesn't need intellectual input yeah you but- have the things ready by easy i mean not execution easy uh-huh. but it's easy to get in the flow and like just just doing things yeah yeah i know and historically i've been on that side right where i'm like oh yeah let's actually figure out what we need to do first uh, and then we can go do them this is a bit of my like physical laziness coming into it yeah, right yeah. i'm i rather much rather spend two days thinking and like planning something yeah. before i actually do it yeah. but i think now i'm realizing that the yes sort of direction is important but i think i have for example undervalued momentum hmm. in the past <laughs> cuz sometimes it's nice to have that momentum yeah. like even if you're headed in like yeah. slightly wrong directions 
it's better than like staying in one one place and like thinking where to go because mm-hmm. yeah, even you though you need that additional information coming in to make yeah, make any yeah. kind of decision because like the literature is there you have read it of course you can read more there's more mm. papers coming in all the time but what's happening in your system and the question you are asking mm-hmm. you do need to move a few steps further before coming up the strategy stage yeah. and actually thinking anything yes yes so that that, that was kind of why i was asking cuz right now i'm in like this sort of weekly system Mm. and that's working it's mm. just like a week of like don't yeah. ask more questions just, just do the do. things you plan mm. um and then we'll figure it out at the end of the week yeah that's pretty cool yeah i think that's a good strategy cuz yeah what has happened with me i think it has been changing with time like there are times when i'm just like just do 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 mm-hmm. and then there are times when i'm like no do 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 and <laughs> just like sitting and thinking and like you know but i think a nicer amalgamation of the two would be mm. pretty cool yeah i know definitely like i have seen people who need to like stop and think that there are like many cases of this where if for example if they're not doing stuff they feel like there is no progress hmm. which is a bit silly hmm. um and yeah they spend a lot of time doing random things yeah yeah but yeah again same thing you yeah. can't just be sitting and thinking also <laughs> yep yep feel you feel things you more than ever <laughs> because now that i'm actually moving i'm like damn mm. this is way simpler than i thought mm. just do some stuff yeah. <laughs> okay yeah yeah i think i am also saying this more because of the last few weeks and months uh-huh. where i try to really push right quite hard right. not as much thinking but really execution mm. Mm. and i got results and i'm like well so <laughs> <laughs> t- turns out if you spend a lot of time doing things some of them work think, yeah, who would have thought <laughs> <laughs> all right so the next one is capitalize on the adversity feature mm-hmm. this is something then is actually likes to say i forget what his exact phrasing is yeah uh, but essentially the idea here is if you run into a problem with your project some roadblock or some barrier that can actually be an opportunity yeah. and i guess yeah this is a little bit of a so psychological like philosophy as well yeah a little bit of like slight of if something happens just take the best out of it slight of mind no i think it's even even more than make the best of it right it's more like this is the thing you have been waiting for okay. like it's is okay. really like yeah. really like doubling down on <laughs> mm-hmm. it it's like you were asking for adversity this whole time yeah. i wasn't <laughs> but you were uh, and here you go mm. and i guess true cuz it could be the shiny part of a project right there was this big thing mm. uh, and then you fixed it and yeah. then now that's something you can show off about yeah, yeah. fair enough uh, this one feels more like mental cope which you need mm. but it is that ultimately mm. right because if you can avoid it you would avoid it yeah i feel like but again like sometimes it really could happen right like you got stuck at something now you're like devising ways to go around it which you normally would not have mm. and now you can just find something bigger just by that just chance yeah yeah so the the way i see it is like there's a roadblock and then you can like make your way through the roadblock or go around it yeah and going through it is sort of the cool courageous thing i guess mm. and this is something you would you can show off mm. but maybe there's also a way to go around it yeah right? that's what i'm saying like if you're going around it you might find something else which normally you would not have thought of oh okay yeah i see so the la- sort of the last thing i think he says is turn a problem on its head uh what i got out of this was that you are of course like you start with some hypothesis or like you're doing some experiments and you find some findings uh and a lot of times things just might not work out the way you thought about initially mm-hmm. and then at that time you can still use the same sort of insights and just ask a different question mm. or you can yeah you just got some insights it's not fitting what you thought earlier it might just now make a new hypothesis it mm-hmm. might just make a new problem that you have found a solution to yeah and you can just think and try to do that yeah this one was pretty nice mm-hmm. um and i guess he has sort of two strat the g's to fix when that happens right um so when you get stuck the first one is like uh letting a sacred fixed parameter float so what that means is oh, like I forgot all this part yeah, yeah so what that means is like if now you were very fixed on i don't know whatever cell line that you were working on and this is for some reason just now working consider doing this in a different cell line okay right so that's that sort of the idea where if you're really really hard stuck it might be worth to like unfix or like let loose some of the fixed parameters mm. uh, it might be a bit difficult to do that at that point though i feel like if you're already feeling confused or you know things are not making sense and then increasing vagueness mm-hmm. complexity as well 
Mm, yeah, maybe the going through the example would make a good sense. So he's talking about like so let's say the project is you're using spatial transcriptomics mm-hmm. to study the interaction between antigen presenting cells and T cells in the tumor microenvironment. Mm-hmm. So you have sort of three parameters. Um but if it comes to does he actually go about which parameters? He doesn't, but I oh shit, that's not very useful because I don't understand this project. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I can see where it might be kind of useful, you know, like where if you are like, I mean, I can take my example. So, for example, the hypothesis is like accumulating R loops will cause the transcription of these genes to change. And then first I was looking at protein coding genes because they are the easiest to do qPCR for, right? Um, And then I found it doesn't actually change. So now, so then I can be like, okay, instead of just doing qPCR, what if I just do RNA-seq? you know, for everything in the cell. And turns out that still doesn't change anything. Um, and then I can see, okay, I'm, I'm, I'm only looking at like long non-coding RNA or whatever, whatever. Uh, with the, sorry, I'm only looking, still looking at protein coding genes with this RNA-seq. What if I looked at long, like total RNA-seq or something? So I guess you can still change a few things and you might get some information out of it. Hmm. Okay. Yeah. And then the second one is basically what you said in the beginning, Yeah. which was like, his example is if you have the if the original idea was to develop small molecule degraders of two kinases, um, but it doesn't work. Now instead of trying to force a situation, you can ask why are these sign uh, sorry which kinases can actually be degraded. So you were first looking at two, and you t- it turns out you can't actually degrade them. Then you can change the question to yeah. okay, there are twenty kinases in the cell. Which of them can actually be degraded? Right. And right. that's that's interesting pretty yeah, cool yeah I think yeah this is also something we have discussed right we I don't know if you do that but like really sticking to your hypothesis you need to keep on changing your hypothesis as and when you are seeing different things or new publications are coming out you need to keep updating instead mm. of just staying like oh this was what I started with and still needs to build that yeah. I'm gonna do everything to make that true yeah yeah this is what I sort of brought up in the beginning right like how often Inside a PhD, you actually get to change your right. research question. Yeah. And there are some things yeah. that make it difficult. Like, for example, I don't know if it was like that for you. But now, uh, if I have to change, for example, the title of my thesis, which I proposed in, like, year one. Mm. Ridiculous, right? I had, not, I didn't, I had no clue. Yeah. If I have to change it, yeah. I have to go through, like, a formal application process. I have to fill out a form, get my supervisor's signature. Okay. And then they have to approve it for me to change the that thesis title. Sense. Yeah, but which of course is, you need to change your th- thesis title, right? Or are you going to just go, go with what you had? I still haven't finalized it. Most okay. likely I will change it. But yeah. I'm just telling you, it's funny it's that they this. make yeah. it like this. Right. For me, actually, we gave some titles in the beginning, in the first year report and stuff. But the final thesis title is what you write in your thesis. Yeah. There was no like fixed thing. You, what you give it in the end is your thesis title. Yeah. So I was just thinking like, I mean, this is just one example. But I think there are a few more things in the system itself yeah. that don't really make it very conducive to change your original yeah. hypothesis. Yeah. You, you sort of have to fight for it. Yeah. That's how research is like done. Things yeah. change. Yeah. <laughs> That's interesting. And this was some this one is more personal, but I also feel like I always thought this is like a very nebulous thing. You know, I never had like a very concrete hypothesis yeah. that I was trying to show. And it's all it was always like trying to build it as we go. Yeah. But if whenever you're working with people, I think especially in a collaborative nature where there are like many people involved, mm. you can't really do that because you need to have everybody on the same page yeah. all the time. Yeah. And that makes people it a bit harder. Be like, what are we working on? Like, what, what's up? Yeah. And it's almost like, this is what we decided. Mm. When did we change tracks? Mm. So every time you think of it, you need to have like an explicit conversation, right. which is something I learned through my experience of having two supervisors. Because mm-hmm. sometimes... Like, let's say one of them is a bit disconnected from whatever's happening. But, you know, like in the last month, you're you're seeing things which now makes this angle more interesting than the other one yeah. that you were focusing on. Yeah. You can't just go there. You need to sort of have an explicit conversation, get everyone on board and then be like, OK, mm-hmm. instead of prioritizing what we said we would prioritize, mm-hmm. let's prioritize this. Yeah. And then you have to wait for everybody to say, OK, yeah. and then we go. <laughs> and yeah, I think that's the... End of the article. Yep. Is there anything else in the tweet thread that's um, not there here? See. There are like a few extra examples, mm-hmm. but it's still based on the same article. Yeah. Any closing thoughts? I will definitely think start thinking more on the problems that I'm working on. 
And I guess my follow up question is did you ever have a point in your time where you thought okay the problem i'm trying to solve is easy not really yeah <laughs> it really. doesn't feel easy like really. i'm trying to think that's, what is an example of our case we are not able to gauge that i think we are not able to zoom out and see mm. the entire field and you know where this what this problem means mm. how and because i never thought about ki this is the problem that i'm trying to solve and how long it's going to take yeah i have never put in much effort and th- thoughts into this but you know when you write a grant mm mm-hmm. that's what exactly what you are doing yeah. you are telling all sorts of assumptions as you mentioned what is known in the field what is this big question you are trying to answer and mm. you know how much insight you already have what is the the likelihood of success in this thing that you are trying to propose uh and what was the last thing you were talking about the the impact etc as well yeah mm-hmm. so yeah we have just not done that yet but do we want to do that <laughs> <laughs> sounds fun but like we'll see Any closing thoughts for you? Uh closing thoughts. I think I open more than close. <laughs> <laughs> I I think with all, like as always with um conversations like these right where it's it's kind of like advice based on somebody's experience or perspective or whatever even if they for example like this guy he's they have built an entire course around this seems mm-hmm. like they they're mm-hmm. teaching this so they've uh, I guess put more thought into it right. than just someone you would talk to over coffee about yeah. what should i do next right yeah. but even then i feel like so for example how many people who are let's say successful in the field have done these exercises for example or like done something like this mm-hmm. so that's what i would want to know you know i think that would be high you think it would be high yeah i want to say it might not be high i think it would be high at least like for higher up people who are who have really made it and i think they definitely think a lot about the sort of problems at that are there as their hand in terms of all the parameters we talked about here maybe not so systematically the way he is proposing it but you have to because like now right now for us it's just like theek hai four years time this much money we are doing it but for them it's like actually writing grants as well getting all mm. the people hiring people and then managing them so everything has to be quite clear in their heads okay let's do an exercise if you can uh like can you show this to ashok and ask him how much of it he resonates with or like if he does anything like it i would just i'm just curious to hear what he says mm. because my intuition tells me that sometimes people sort of like brute force through stuff um and then only in hindsight you come up with like oh yeah this is how i did it and this mm. is how you should do it mm-hmm. um and i mean I, i it's still useful it's nice to like have people who do this i really actually appreciate it a lot yeah. um but i also feel like sometimes it's it's kind of like okay you read it you you pick what you can but then you you go back and do what what you want to do <laughs> in some ways it's